This is Ryan Pierce, host of Completely Serious. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Nicole Kelly, host of Loud and Proud here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Loud and Proud, where we talk about issues facing the disability community. A new show comes out weekly. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of Loud and Proud. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. Welcome to How to Write Good. I'm your host, Daniel Poppy. Find out more about me at danielpoppy.com. Find out uh, more about How to Write Good at Facebook. Actually, if you go go to danielpoppy.com, you're going to find out a lot more. and It's the hub for everything. There's not a lot of stuff up there. I'm working on a book, so hopefully that book is out pretty soon. If you, uh, if you haven't liked on Facebook, please like on Facebook. That's a big help to me. And also, please check out Public House Media because How to Write Good would not be here if it weren't for Public House Media. So uh, the... This week we have our first guest. Uh, I made that aware, made you aware of that last week. And uh, the guest I have this week is a friend of mine. I've known him since sophomore or junior year. I think we have a bit of a disagreement about that, but uh, he is a student of philosophy at Purdue, and he's been extremely gracious. We've actually we've had been having audio issues, and he's been really really patient uh, and just allowed me to continue to ask him to try again and again and again. We seriously tried this about five or six times, and it's getting really frustrating to me. But uh, without further ado, so uh, I'm going to introduce you to Vince Jacobson, a uh, philosophy student at Purdue. He also teaches at Purdue. There's a few pictures out there. If you're one of his students listening, please get me more pictures. Send me pictures in the inbox to How to Write Good, and I will post them. And nobody will know who it is. All right. So, Vince, thank you for being here. Hi. Hi. All right. So, Vince and I have known each other since um, sophomore or junior year. Vince, you think it's you think it was sophomore year? Yeah, and but I don't sure. Why is that? You don't know anymore? No. And I think it's junior year. But uh, he snubbed me the first day we met. He doesn't believe me. He thinks I'm lying. But I'm going to continue to hold that. I, when, when I meet people, I and if they know Vince, I'm like, yeah, Vince snubbed me the first time we met. He just like didn't talk to me for two years. But uh, without, without any further ado, we're going to actually get into what we're talking about. And uh, Vince, I just appreciate you taking the time out of your day. This yeah, week, no we actually should have been done. Or like an hour ago, and uh, then, like I said before, he's been really, really gracious. He's been able to, he's just allowed me to continue to try things, and even he, moved, he went a half an hour to another location for better Wi-Fi, so thanks a lot, Vince. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Don't worry about that. All right, so we're going to jump into that if you don't mind, into what we're going to talk about today if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. All right, so Vince and I were talking, and when I um, when I asked him to be on the show, he's like, oh, what, what should we talk about? And with me, I want to talk about something that people... Uh, my guest is interested in what they're already thinking about. So they have, uh, they have more to say about it. And it's also something that I wouldn't have thought about. And since Vince is in the philosophy, he thinks about things really deeply and he probably wouldn't say that, but he does. All right. So he brought up, Oh, we could talk about how the meanings of sentences are representational abstract objects that exist necessarily. So we are going to be talking about that today. I know it sounds like something that is very, um, that is really deep and something that you're not going to be able to understand, but I promise you that we're, Vince is going to be able to explain it in a way that, and we're going to be able to talk about it in a way that people are going to be under, under, able to understand it, the regular layman. Uh, because we, I do have a guest this week, um, we're not going to be doing the word of the week, and we're not going to be doing the, the logical fallacy of the week. I want to just focus on the guest, what the guest has to say, and we're going to have plenty of time to do that. So, Vince, so what you said is the meanings of sentences, just to repeat for the audience and for us, the meanings of sentences are representational abstract objects that exist necessarily. So could you give us like a brief overview of what you mean about this? Yeah, um, sure. So we can, you said three things. They're representational, you said that they're abstract objects, and you said they exist necessarily. So we can talk about all three of those. Um, so let's start with the fact that they are abstract objects. Um, okay, so you can think of... Imagine, uh, in English, you say, the dog is red, mm -hmm. right? Um, okay, so that's one sentence mm -hmm. you said, not a proposition, but a sentence. Um, and it's not an abstract object. It exists. It has, like, um, it exists in time and space, right? Um, you can hear it, stuff like that. Um, then you've got, imagine somebody in, in Spain who says that in, in Spanish. I think in Spanish it's el perro es rojo. Mm -hmm. um, or if the dog is a 
female. It's like La Perros Roja. Yeah, I think my wife would um, know because she speaks Spanish. Yeah. Um, yeah, you should have her come over here and clarify well, it for she's him. not here right now, otherwise I would ask if she's not actually... Well, I can, I, I can wait. No. <laughs> <laughs> we can wait for seven hours until she gets back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, six. So, but yeah, okay. we'll ask her. We'll just wait online. We'll just let uh, we'll let the audio go for that line. We'll just yep. we'll yep. back. How about that? Or just talk about <laughs> random crap until she can confirm. Yeah. But uh, no. Yeah, okay. we... we um, no, so the thought is, okay, you got two sentences there. They're not abstract objects, mm -hmm. but... In a way, they both express the same thing, mm -hmm. right? You know, El Perro is rojo and um, the dog is red. They express the same thing. And the thought is, okay, what they express is the proposition. Okay. okay. So the proposition... No, go ahead. So you say that the sentences themselves aren't abstract objects, okay? Right? Is that what you right. said? So yeah. what makes something an abstract object? Are you going to explain that? So one view of abstract objects is that they're not material objects. Okay. Okay, so a material object exists in time and space. An abstract object doesn't exist in time and space. Okay. okay um, um, another thing you can say is that you know material objects, because they are exist in time and space, they have parts. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can imagine like a ball or something. You can cut the ball in half, and yeah. it's got the left and the right side. Um, abstract objects they don't exist in time and space, so they don't have parts. Okay. Um, it, it doesn't make sense to talk about parts. Like think about half of your mind yeah you can think about half of your brain but yeah. not half of your mind right um, that doesn't make any sense um or something like that half of the number one you can okay, think of you half. Can. yeah and you'd have to make that one half like you like it's not yeah. or like any half. part right yeah you're you, like i don't know so you'd actually have to so if you're trying to um take apart an abstract object you are you, you can't, can't do that you can't do yeah. you actually have to make another object up or you have to think about another object because we're talking about it a little differently. You have to actually think about another object to uh, see half of that. So for the number one, if I split it in half, it's one half, but one half is different than number one. Is that, yeah, is exactly. that right? Okay. That's exactly right. You can't split apart an abstract object. It okay. doesn't have any parts. Um, right. So, okay. yeah, so that, that's what it is to be an abstract object. It's not to exist in time and space. It's not to have parts. Okay, so and there's probably more to it than that, but I think that this is suffices for whatever we're talking about. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense to me. So, okay. so you are saying that we have specific sentences and they connect yes. to propositions, right? That's yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. The way what I said instead of connect, but connect was just fine too. Okay. I said they express. Right? Okay, okay, um, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, so that's, that, that's cool. you can say that's one kind of connection. One kind of connection is expression. So. Um, these sentences, these two different sentences express the same thing. Okay. What they express is a proposition. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can communicate in a way you can communicate because, or you can translate because, you know, this sentence expresses the same proposition as this other sentence in English. Okay. Right? Okay. Yep. So what you've expressed isn't something that you hear. Mm -hmm. You hear a sentence, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, it's not something you can touch or something like that, right? Um, it's not something you can perceive. It's not something that exists as a material object, right? Mm -hmm. the, the proposition isn't. Um, you hear, um, you perceive the sentence. The sentence isn't the proposition. The sentence expresses the proposition. Okay. So the sentence might be something that you know isn't abstract, but the proposition it expresses is abstract. All right. Right. So okay. the sentence itself, what you're saying, the sentence is, from what I'm hearing, is that the sentence is the actual words you're saying. So it's the actual. Yeah. So the sentence would come out to the way you're forming the sounds. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It's like the way uh, the. Um, sound waves moving through the air create the sentence like that's what carries the sentence right is that right right that's exactly okay. right and then the proposition is whatever is expressed by that sentence okay can you go into this idea of propositions a little bit um yeah so i, I think what i'm trying to do is I'm trying to take apart those three parts that you said you said they're representational abstract objects okay. that exist necessarily so i've explained the abstract object part mm -hmm. um now i have to do the representational part okay okay so the thought is what propositions do, or a feature of propositions, something you can say about them, is that they're true or false. Okay. Right? Yeah, so, um, a lot of philosophers call that like a property of propositions, that they're true or false. A property is something like, and everything has properties. You have a property of being mm -hmm. however tall you are. I have a property of being like, pretty short. Or um, objects, the, the classic examples are colors. So mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at vitamin water right now. The liquid has the color, of, has a property of being red, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so propositions have properties too. They have a property of being true or false. Okay. Okay. Um, and the way they're true or false is if they represent the world a certain way. Okay. Okay. 
So a proposition, whatever proposition is expressed by the dog is red. Um, it represents the world as being such that the dog there is red. All right. Okay. If the dog really is red, then the proposition has accurately represented the world. Okay. If the world isn't, isn't like that, then the proposition has inaccurately represented the world. So then it's false. Okay. Right. So um, so can I take a like a, a brief break right here? Yeah. So with proposition propositions, that's something I think is more like a philosophical term. And Vince, you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but with propositions, it's like a statement you're making about something. Is that is that right? Yeah. So like he's saying the dog yeah. is red. So if you make an exclamation, so if you say, oh, like that's not a proposition. Or if you ask a question, a question isn't a proposition either, right? No, that's exactly right. That's exactly so the, right. the proposition yeah. is you're making a statement and the statement can either be true or false. So he's saying the dog is red. I could say that I am the smartest person in the world. Now that's false, but it's, I'm making a claim. I'm making a claim about something and mm-hmm. that's something that I think somebody might come across um, more often. So there's a claim being made about something. And the claim can either be true or false. And Vince is using the term proposition in the same way, I think. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, do you want to actually, do you want to flag what you just said, like to bring it up later when we talk about objections? Okay, so, so I'll talk about propositions. No, you know, I'll, talk um, about like flag questions and commands and stuff like that, because that's okay, actually so part of an important objection to propositions. Okay, so I'll remember, I'll remember, I'm going to quick write that down, but you keep on going. Um, You were talking about propositions, whether they were true or false. I'll talk, I'll write that down so I remember it. Okay, sure. So um, we've explained that they're abstract objects, we've explained what it means that they represent things, um, and and the way they represent things, and by virtue of representing things a certain way, they're true or false. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's the thing that they exist necessarily. Right. Okay. But to exist necessarily means that they couldn't ever have failed to exist. They always have to exist. Have to exist. Okay. Um, so the thought is, okay, at any time, any proposition is always either true or false, right? Okay. So okay. think of a sentence like, um, Napoleon is dead. Mm-hmm. A thousand years from now, that'll be true. A thousand years ago, it was true. You know, at, at mm-hmm. one point in time, it was, it was false. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, no matter what, even at the beginning of creation or something, or, like, Maybe millions of years ago, you could have asked someone, like, is Napoleon, uh, Napoleon is dead, true or false? And they would have said, true or false, right? Um, and that proposition yep. would have been true or false. Yeah. So the thought is that propositions are always true or false, okay? Um, but in order to be true or false, in order to have a property, uh, the proposition has to exist. Something has to exist in order for it to have a property. Okay. It would be odd to say, like, um, this thing is true or false. Oh, but it doesn't exist. Yeah. You'd say, well, then wait, what do you mean? What's true or false? If nothing exists, if that's not a thing, how can it be true or false? Okay. So, it has to exist in order to be true or false, but we just said, okay, it's always either true or false. So, propositions mm-hmm. always exist. Um, so, therefore, okay. propositions exist necessarily. Or okay, eternal. so, the, so if, so that's, that's somewhere where I think my, my brain has a little hard time dicing that up um i wonder if you have the same difficulty so when i when you say okay if something has to be true or false then this the something the proposition must exist okay and for me like that's you know you know when you get to the point where you're trying to understand something and you seem to run to the like run into a wall in terms of your own ability to think or yeah. logic does, does that happen with you or, or is there more to that that you could explain yeah yeah that happens to me and it kind of, it kind of bothers me um with this very issue too so it's something to exist it has to for something to be true or false, it has to exist kind of bothers me a little bit. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but, yeah. I mean, and there are people that will definitely challenge that. There's, um, I don't know, have you heard this before? They say that for any weird view, there's some philosopher who's held it. Um, so that means that if that's true, then there's a philosopher who's held the view that there are no propositions. Nevertheless, there are propositions that are true or false. Okay. Um, okay. So wait. So you like any view that? So you're essentially say, saying that any philosopher, like if there's a view, there's a opposite view that's being held, right? Yeah. There's an opposite view yeah. than the one that you're holding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, therefore, there's somebody who disagrees with me when I say in order to have a property, you have to exist. They would probably disagree with okay. that. Okay. But um, it seems so plausible, that, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. It seems that if you have if if you have a property. If there's a property, and and when you mean properties, like if we take a more um, a, a property that we're more uh, familiar with, like a color is a property, right? Yeah, is that correct? Yeah, so, um, yeah. Think of like properties as like adjectives. Okay. Okay. So like to say true or false is an adjective, right? It's describing a noun. The noun being the proposition. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Anything you can make into an adjective could be like a property. 
Okay, so that makes sense to me. So yeah, you can yeah. stick it in front of a noun. Um, so I just want to quickly go back to something now. When you, okay, so you were saying so when when you were talking about this, yeah. you were talking about how uh, they're representational abstract objects. I know we kind of talked about how uh, sentences link to objects, but I just like to talk about this idea of objects a little bit more. Uh, okay. if, you, if we could talk about that. So from yeah, what yeah. I understand with objects is that they are um, they're accessible, something accessible to everything. So an object wouldn't be just something in my own mind that you can't access apart from me. It, mm -hmm. if, if it wasn't, if it wasn't an object. So uh, an object is something that if I never even told you about it, or if I never um, conveyed an idea to you, you'd still be able to grasp mm -hmm. that idea or find that idea. Yeah. So you mean by objects and that's like um, publicly accessible yeah. is what you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that Fair is enough. that right? Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah. Sure. Okay. You're just stipulating a definition. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So and I was wondering if that's what you meant when you talked about oh, objects. Oh. Yeah. Context. Um. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that'll work. Okay. <laughs> that'll. Okay. It sounds good. All right. So, is there anything else you'd like to say about this, or do you want to jump into um, like, objections? Well, um, do, do you think that makes sense? I think I, I messed up a little bit the argument for um, them existing necessarily. I said they always are either true or false. In order to be true or false, they have to be they have to exist. And then, and then, then, yeah, then yeah, I yeah, um, yeah. I made a mistake and said after that, therefore they exist necessarily. I should have just concluded from that, therefore they always exist, um, not that they always exist necessarily. Yeah. Um, so I should qualify that and, and change it so it goes like this: you know, propositions must always be either true or false. In order to be true or false, they have to exist, so propositions must always exist. And that's the same thing as saying they exist necessarily. Okay. Yeah, because prop if you have a proposition that Napoleon mm -hmm. is dead, then it's either going to be true or false. It's not going to be it's not going to be so it's mm -hmm. not going to be something else. They're always going to be mm -hmm. either true or false. And the proposition is going to continue to exist. Um, yeah. Like it's going to continue to exist. And the fact that it continues to exist and always has existed is necessarily mm -hmm. that's where the necessarily yeah. comes in right yeah um actually this okay. gives us like ammo uh i forgot about this until now this gives us ammo ammunition for a new argument that propositions are not just sentences so some people think that okay no okay. what's true or false is the sentence not the proposition expressed by it and um yeah this kind of shows okay propositions exist necessarily right um we just showed that mm -hmm. well then propositions can't be sentences because sentences don't exist necessarily right there could have been a world mm -hmm. where no human beings existed and or no speaking creatures existed and so there'd be no sentences right um yeah so that means that sentences don't exist necessarily they exist contingently so uh, like accidentally well, kind of thing okay um, yeah and what he means by accidentally is there's by there, there's yeah. something that doesn't have yeah. to exist it's something extra um in that way yeah he doesn't mean like it's an accident yeah. they exist it's just something extra on yeah. the other thing accidental, things. accidental but, uh, here and mistake don't mean the same thing yeah, it doesn't mean mistake. Okay, so with that, though, that I, that doesn't make sense to me in terms of the sentences not existing because we, um, maybe you've already stated this, but we convey the propositions through sentences. Mm -hmm. But how would it work that sentences wouldn't exist but propositions exist? The fact that a sentence expresses a proposition, that doesn't have to mean that a proposition can only exist by being expressed by a sentence. So um, okay. think of like, I mean, try to imagine, a, think of a statement that you think nobody has ever said before um if you can do that without saying it i mean there you don't have a sen the sentence doesn't exist for, but nevertheless okay. the thought exists um yeah the thought still exists okay. um maybe someone could object to that by saying yeah but i'm thinking about it in words and maybe that's a sentence um sure i don't know um that might work but the thought is um it makes sense to think of a, a world where a possible world an imaginary scenario where nothing exists at all nevertheless it seems like at I shouldn't say nothing exists at all, because I'd say propositions exist at that world. But um, you can imagine, like, there's no speaking creatures or anything like that. There's no sentences, mm -hmm. there's no thoughts, and there's no language. And it still makes sense to say, you know, Napoleon doesn't exist at that world. That statement is true. Uh, that yeah. proposition is true at that world. Yeah. So then it's inclined to, we're inclined to say, okay, so um, uh, propositions exist at that world, even though no sentences exist at that world. Okay, so what it seems like you're saying is, like, there are certain things still true or false about that yeah, world, exactly. and if there were a way to express those things, those things would be either true or false. So the fact that you can't express something doesn't mean there's a doesn't mean there isn't a proposition about yeah. it that could be expressed. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. That's exactly right. Uh, so what? So 
this is one of you, like you said, there's always somebody with a view that is opposite of the one you have. What are some obje- objections that somebody might have to this? Um, well, let's, I like the one that you brought up where you said, um, you're talking about questions and exclamations. Mm-hmm. So this is an, uh, an interesting one. So the way I argued originally for propositions existing was by saying, here are two different sentences in different languages. These are languages, they're not the same sentence, but they mm-hmm. ex- somehow they say the same thing, what they say is a proposition. Yeah. Well, someone's going to mm-hmm. say, okay, well, do you think questions are propositions? And I'll be like, no, because mm-hmm. they're not true or false. And they'd say, okay, well, I can tell you, um, uh, come and eat, or something, for example, um, in English. Yeah. And then I think someone in Italian can say, like, bene mangia. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I hear my mom say. I have no idea if that actually means come and eat. <laughs> but, um, I mean, sounds like it could mean that, right? So, I mean, there, you got two different sentences uh, in different languages, and they express the same thing. Oh, I mean, that's a, there's a proposition for that, but there are no propositions that aren't, aren't true or false. The command come yeah. and eat isn't true or false. Mm-hmm. So therefore, you've, got, you've said, okay, you've proven that now there are propositions for commands, and you didn't want to do that, so maybe your argument's gone wrong somewhere. Okay. Um, does that make sense? Um, I, think, I think that I have to think about it a little bit more. Yeah. But, yeah, so it's... it's I guess sometimes... So- Sometimes when Vince talks, and this isn't a dig at you at all, sometimes I need to like take some time and actually process what he says because it's like it's something that I don't necessarily understand right away and I've got to just think about it. So I don't know if I understand that completely right away, but I think that if I have time to think about it, that would um, it would probably click with me after a while. Uh, let, me, let me try to put it like this. Like this. Sure. Um, so originally I said, okay, if you have two sentences that express different that say express the same thing in different languages, that proves that they are propositions. Okay. Yep. But here's, here is another example where there are two sentences that express um, the same thing, um, but you don't want to say they express propositions. Yeah. Meaning that your argument doesn't necessarily show what you wanted it to show. It doesn't show that there are propositions. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, so that, that's that's one objection. It shows that like my argument for propositions has failed. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that there's a way out. I think there's a way out. Um, if anyone's curious about this, I, I got this argument from, um, like the objection, I got it from a book by Trenton Merricks. Um, it's called, just called Propositions. So a lot of what I'm saying is kind of relying on, on his work in that book. But um, I think the way out is to go, like, it was like this, apparently this Stoic position, like ancient Greek philosophy. The Stoics had this view that even questions and, uh, and uh, commands and stuff um, in sentences express uh, something. Mm-hmm. They, they call it like lekta, mm-hmm. L-E-K-T-A. Um, those are like abstract objects. They're abstract objects that are expressed by questions. Mm-hmm. They're abstract objects that are expe- expressed by commands. And then there are abstract objects that are expressed by true or false, you know, by sentences mm-hmm. that look like they're true or false. Okay. Um, so what they would say is, yeah, you know, you're, both those questions express the same thing. They express the same lecta, mm-hmm. right? The same abstract, like, you know, question. Mm-hmm. It's just that some of those lecta are true or false. Mm-hmm. And that's a proposition. Okay. Um, so I guess the, the argument that, I, what that shows then is the argument that I gave at the beginning for propositions. Someone who offers that, maybe you should consider saying that they're abstract objects representing for questions and commands too. Well, when you make, when you make a question or a command, could it be argued that you are making assumptions that aren't necessarily expressed in what they're said, but they are needed to express it? So, like instead of that could, instead of the uh, instead of questions and demands being a proposition themselves, they're built off of proposition. Yeah, sorry, I think you something like rephrase it so it's like um, come and eat is something like this is just an offer. Like you should come and eat right now. That's true or false? Okay. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah. Is that what yeah, you're maybe thinking? something like yeah. that, or like, yeah, or there's yeah. there's there's propositions that need to be in a case for you actually to say something like that. So, uh, mm-hmm. when you say come and eat, you have to either say, well, is it food? Is that true or false? Um, the, is the person hungry or different things like that? I'm I'm not getting to the point directly, but um, do you know what I mean by that? So like, there's different I ideas think... behind it. There's different propositions that are propping up that question or that. Um, yeah, I think I think I get what you're saying, um, and, and I think that's. Um, that's something that I think I think Bertrand Russell had this view. So Bertrand Russell wanted to say something like, "Okay, when you have questions or commands, you can kind of rephrase those and or tweak them to turn them into true or false statements, and that's what's expressed. Okay. So it is a proposition yeah. after all. It just sounds like it's a question or something like that. Um, I think that's Russell's view, but don't quote me on that. Um, okay. Uh, but yeah, so- I, mean, I mean, that sounds like what kind of what you're trying to say, and and that's one possibility. Yeah. 
And uh, you don't know this. Well, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the audience, Vince. But Vince actually sent me a paper because I needed a little bit of background on this. And I think that the guy who wrote that, I don't remember who wrote that, but he actually, I thought he was talking about questions as well in that context. And maybe hmm. that's where I'm drawing that idea from. I can't remember exactly, though. Uh, maybe he was. No. I'm not entirely sure. I mean, he was just talking about thoughts okay. right, at the time. I can't remember. If, I mean, so thought you can have thoughts that are questions, I guess. I, I don't remember offhand whether he mentions questions in there, but maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. Okay. Um, All right. Um, yeah. Could yeah. you could you outline a different objection that you might have to this argument of pro- uh, propositions always existing? Um, here's like a common one. Uh, the argument is that, and it's not, it's not too much of an argument, but it's pretty mm-hmm. common anyway. It's kind of like an intuition. So it's kind of trying to push like a motivation, like you guys all agree with me, don't you? Um, and it goes like this, like, you know, try to do Occam's razor on the kinds of things that exist, right? You don't want to, even with like with any scientific theory, you don't want to have a theory that's more complicated than it needs to be to explain what you see. Um, same thing here. Try to do Occam's razor on um, the phenomena that you see living your life, you know, in communication and stuff. Do you see, um, do you need to posit propositions as some kind of abstract objects that exist in order to explain communication? And um, if you don't, then do Occam's razor, um, omit those Commit those um, uh, propositions and, and stick with a simpler explanation. So that, that, that that's another route. Um, yeah, so maybe that's not an intuition pump. I I, I ended yeah. up phrasing the argument differently than I expected to, and that's actually that's actually a more substantial criticism. If, if you do Occam's razor, if you don't do Occam's razor, you're ending up with a theory that's more okay. complicated and therefore more likely to be wrong. Um, but that that's one argument, um, and maybe they would say instead you can explain communication by talking about how you know. If there's no propositions, you communicate because not because you express the same proposition by these different languages, but by the fact that you use the terms in the same way. So people in Spain use rojo in the same circumstances that people in like America um, will use the word red. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, if, imagine somebody who only speaks Spanish um, sitting next to you, and you're both looking at like a red book, um, like um, so you're both looking at this book and. Uh, the red book, the one that I gave you from Carl Jung. Yeah, so you, you, you will have that, and you're both looking at it, and the person who speaks Spanish will say, um, the book is red and in Spanish. And you will say in English, the book is red. right? Um, now, mm-hmm. on this, this objector's view, there's no proposition. So how do you know that you're talking the same, the same thing? How do you communicate with each other? And the thought is, okay, well, because, you know, when the person says, sees red things, they say rojo. And when you see red things, you say red, and you, they reply with the same with the word rojo every time they see red things, and you reply with red whenever you see red things. Mm-hmm. And so, because these words function the same way, you can kind of tell that they um, express the same thing or that they mean the same thing for each person. Um, and that's how you can communicate by saying, okay, these terms function the same way, so they're interchangeable. Okay, but wouldn't that break down because the book is red? Like, if the book is red, it's it's either red or it's not red. Therefore, there's a proposition that goes with it. Um, it yeah, so maybe what you're saying is that there's a um, that objection or that theory still is victim or doesn't avoid one of the other arguments I gave for propositions, which was like, imagine a world where the only thing that exists is like a book floating in space, no people. Or, mm-hmm. uh, maybe the book doesn't have any words in it, it's just empty pages, just so that we don't have any way to talk about words. Um, it's still mm-hmm. true that that um, book that that book is, is read or isn't read, right? Okay. That proposition is still true or false. Um, and uh, so you think, okay, well then there's a proposition at that world. That yeah. Um, I think the way people try to avoid that, and this is kind of complicated. I'm not sure I totally understand it, but they'll try to say, okay, the proposition there that's true about the book is a proposition that's true with us, the ones who are mm-hmm. talking. So that way, I mean, that so it's the sentences that we're uttering when we're thinking yeah. about it, but not in the actual world that we're imagining ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, that's a, that's a tricky argument, and I have to think more about that one. Okay. All right, so we are coming up to the end, so we're going to wrap this up if that's fine with you, Vince. Yeah, fine. Otherwise, if you have anything else that you want to add. Um, no. This, this is, again, like I was saying, this may be a little bit heavier conversation than usual. It may take you a little bit more time to sort through it, or maybe there's some stuff that you may not understand. But uh, I think it's really beneficial for people to get out of their comfort zone in terms of thinking. And I think that Vince would actually agree with that as well. And I'm sure that he does get out of his comfort zone with thinking 
a lot because he's a philosophy student. But I think philosophy is really important. And even if you don't necessarily understand something, I was actually, Vince asked me this question about um, what was the purpose of my podcast and what I was talking about and what I've conveyed. I mean, besides being a, a poke in the eye to people because it's a it's incorrect grammar, how to write good is incorrect grammar, so people get annoyed and it's just trolling people. It's also to try to understand how to write well. Uh, it's how to write good, how to write something good, not just a, how to write well and, and strategies you can use for writing well. Uh, and in that way, and I think there's there's a saying that uh, if you can think well, you can write well. If you're a good thinker, you're also a good writer because you can convey things. And as I talked before, it's really important to understand the world better because how I define art is something that uh, you use uh, like a lens you're looking through that reveals the world more clearly to you. And I think that it's important to think about these things because when you think about these things, uh, even if it's not necessarily something that's your biggest interest, it helps you to better understand the world. And then once you get back into your own writing or once you get back to anything create, you're going to be representing the world more clearly. And if that is the goal of art, then that's going to help more. Uh, Vince, I really appreciate you coming on. We went over a little bit, but I mean, I usually go over a lot longer. Uh, I really appreciate the conversation. I think it's really interesting. I think that we could probably go on talking about this for an hour. Um, yeah, probably. But yeah, we probably could. And in the future, I mean, I really appreciate if you come on again. We could have some other conversations. Uh, maybe in the future have one that isn't as... Um, I think this is really interesting. Not everybody thinks this is interesting. Maybe we have one that's a bit more fun or, or yeah. other ones that are, are about different uh, concepts. But I really appreciate you coming on. No, so thank thanks you. a lot. This is a lot of fun for me, too. So, all right. So uh, this is How to Write Good. I will see you next week. And I guess we're going to be back on For Just Me. So I hope that uh, you enjoyed your time with Vince because you're back with me after that. All right. Thank you. Have a good rest of your week.